So Lazarus, let's start with you a little bit. Tell us a little bit about you. How did you get to where you've got to? So my path um, was a little bizarre and random. I actually had, uh, I, I was actually, I was born in Romania and we, we left in the 70s, stayed in a refugee camp, came to the United States. And I had my first job. Wait, 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 wait. You said that in one sentence, you've yeah, covered yeah. half a world there. Yeah. Stayed in a refugee camp. Tell us yeah. a little bit more about that if you don't mind. Well, I mean, in fairness, uh, yeah, I was, I was young. I don't really remember it, but um, the, uh, we, we basically, we snuck across the border. Uh, so this was in the early 70s and, you know, Iron Curtain. And uh, if, if you think about the stories people tell about North Korea today, that's what it was like living in communist Romania. Uh, and it's hard for people who are sort of in their, you know, 20s to kind of, you know, when I talk to them, get their heads around exactly how oppressive and bad it was. But it was things like uh, school children were asked by their teachers to report on any anti-government things their parents might be saying. And if you were reported to the, the secret police, people would disappear, like neighbors would just disappear and never be seen from again. Terrifying, awful, evil, evil place. And uh, my father had always wanted to be free, always wanted to come to America. And, um, sorry. And um, <laughs> it goes over great in the States. The, uh, <laughs> they, they love that part. Um, but he, uh, you know, one day we packed up, we, we snuck across the border and, um, and we stayed in a refugee camp. And actually I was able to go back a few years ago for the first time to the refugee camp. The camp's in Austria and it's still there. Um, but instead of being filled with folks from Eastern Europe, it's now filled with people from Africa. Uh, but it's still there, still taking people in and giving them a path to sort of freedom and a better life. When did you know that you was going to be a manager? When did it strike when, you? When? The last year when uh, I was in Milan with Saki, Saki was going to be a manager for the national team and uh, he asked me when I stopped playing, he would like to have me as assistant and so I take that, that opportunity when I stopped playing and I went directly as assistant uh, of Saki in the national team and, and there I started to think as a manager. No? But I have a lot of passion, I have the same passion that when, when I was a kid when I started to play and so... So they say do a job that you love, you never work a day in your life. How does it feel to be fired? It's not the first time that I was fired. We'll, I, I, I don't think that will be the last. <laughs> <laughs> and so I consider a part of my job. The question uh, of the club is to bring, to bring an identity in, in, in the club, in, in the team. You know? So when I arrived in Chelsea, they asked me to build a clear identity of, of the play. I bring the identity. And after that, I have to respect the culture, the tradition. We are, in a, in a way, very outspoken and direct, but as Werner alluded to, sometimes not necessarily saying exactly what it is that we're trying to say, right? Um, we are, in a way, very structured, very process-oriented, very organized, and it struck me as slow, uh, but we're more thoughtful. Um, more deliberate and in the beginning what seems slow now seems thoughtful in the beginning what seems too processed too bureaucratic um, is actually more deliberate and more quality decisions come out of that so it's an adjustment so you try your hand at the podcasting democratizing radio that doesn't quite pay off what do you do next so it turns out that if you don't use your own, if you build something because you think it's a good idea, but you don't actually use it yourself or enjoy it yourself, then you're lacking what I refer to as emotional investment. And you need that. You, you have to have emotional investment. Success isn't guaranteed if you have emotional investment, but failure pretty much is. And we just didn't, we had an honest, very frank conversation, Evan and I. I said, even if we do figure out a way to succeed, at, at podcasting and be, we become the kings of podcasting. Is that what you want to be? And he said, oh, no. And I said, neither do I. I said, what are we doing? So what we, Evan, Evan had a smart idea. He was the CEO of Audio. He said, why doesn't everyone just take two weeks and just build something completely different, build something you want to build, build something that you enjoy, and let's just see what happens. And I'll try to sell Audio. How do you shift your sales force, your mindsets, to something that's so radically different? We started you know, with two axes. The first one, leadership. We know, despite the product, there is a clear territory, a big market. Let's implement you know, my leadership, 
with the existing team we've got in the US. Very quickly, the, the team understood my approach and really uh, embraced it. And we've seen some quick wins just from that. After, we have to, uh, to think about product and we have, we have tried to do some, to create some disruption through innovation. You know, for many years, vendors or software vendors were trying to compete, to compare, and to catch up in certain area. We saw this year, doesn't make sense to us. We need to be very focused. We need to be the best at what we do and bring you know, innovation to our customers. So since you know, I was having a little bit of a chat earlier, I worked for PepsiCo far too many years ago. And we were sharing notes and stories. I worked for a tough, hard-driving, unforgiving, but winning culture. It was the challenger brand. And I said, I shared with her that I did three years, three months. If I'd done the fourth month, I'd have had a coronary. This was the toughest thing I've ever done. It taught me so much about winning. We, were, we had 90 day bonuses. Every 90 days, we could earn 60% of our annual salary. And they chose those who wanted recognition, those who wanted to win, those who were able to run fast. If I look back, there's lots of things not to be proud of. We talked about this. And I was, sharing, I was curious, how do you take a culture that was so, so focused, laser-like focus on numbers, not people? How have you moved it to be one of the, one of the cultures that we all talk about positively today? That's a hell of a journey. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can tell you where we started from. Please. Because when Renee said that to me, I went, oh dear God. Um, I remember when I first came and, I, and a recruiter called me and said, oh, that's a really tough organization, PepsiCo. Um, you know, you're, you're going to find this interesting. Now, you have to appreciate, Indra wanted to change the company and transform the company, not just change it. Change the culture, change how we operated, and change power structure. Um, and so, at, at that point, we, we started from a culture of heroes, a culture of independent people, a culture that wasn't learning like they could and should because they didn't listen. They, mm -hmm. they were not in active listening is the, is the mode. Um, and when you think about, you know, we're a company that does business in 200 countries, uh, you and that many consumers and 260,000 employees, we better get better at listening to one another. So, so, and we were also highly decentralized, yes. and so um, it was important to start to say, why should we change? And you know, every business model, every organization has its day, right? And it starts to have the need to change. And we needed to change because our business model was running out of gas. What do you think you're going to do different going forward as a team, not just you, as a team? So we've got to get better. Uh, as an SMT uh, in, in not only um, uh, communicating among ourselves, but communicating every day with the rest of the organization and the rest of the world that we're together, that we're committed to this goal of ending extreme poverty, that we'll do whatever it takes to make sure that the entire institution is with us on this, to make sure that we're doing all the things that will get them to trust that we care about them, we care about their career paths, we care about uh, 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 the, the amount of busy work that they have to do versus the amount of substantive work that they can do. Uh, and it's only, it's only gonna work if we actually do it. And uh, uh, you know, when Alan Mulally, the great CEO of, uh, of Ford came here, what he said was, you gotta do those surveys because those are things you just can't hide from. So we have no intention. We're not gonna hide from this. We're gonna continue to do it and every year, uh, we're going to listen hard to the messages, and we're going to try to get better. People have to feel that things are different. If they don't feel that things are different, it, it's just so much hot air. Absolutely. So, so there's a lot of work.